Being a psychiatrist in a mental hospital has many challenges, but one that you hope you never have to face is the idea of literally bringing your work home with you. But what happens when that barrier is broken? The sanctity of your home is violated and you are left with nothing but your own electric rage. What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listen in the dark. It's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my spookies. It's Wednesday, and you know what that means. It's time for a little spooky in your weekly. I'm your host and narrator, Enrique Kuto, and we have quite a show for you. This story is positively electric as we dive into the concept of love and life and death and so much more. But before we get to the story, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us, especially during this time of the year when most people aren't really thinking about spooky stories every single week. You know, the average listener is around in October, November, December. But you, my dear listener, you are a spooky through and through. And I'm happy to bring that spooky to you on the weekly. And if you love what we do here at the show, there's an easy way to help us out that doesn't cost you a penny. And that is to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps other spookies know they're in the right place and in for a scare. Now, if you want to help in a more direct way, you can go to weeklyspooky.com where not only will you find every episode we've ever published, but you can find a link to our Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get two bonus shows every 30 days and a whole lot of undying gratitude. That's at weeklyspooky.com. And if subscriptions aren't your thing, you can grab yourself a t-shirt, a hat, a hoodie, a lot of other assorted merch by going to weeklyspooky.com and clicking on store. And if you love hanging out with other spookies, just head to Facebook. We have a free group just for you called Weekly Spookies Tomb of Terror. It's free to join and you get to hang out with myself, some of the authors and other spookies as we share memes and scary news stories and the like. It's a lot of fun. But now, my dear listener, it's about time for this positively electric story after these quick words. I used to be a doctor in an insane asylum. My patient destroyed my world by Michael Kelso. This story needs to be told. Those who have suffered must understand why. It's not as simple as some have made it to be which is why it needs to come from the person most responsible. Me. It began when I was least expecting it. But then, don't things always seem to happen that way? I'm telling you, Doc, people just don't understand, Frederick said while rocking back and forth in the chair. What exactly don't they understand? I said, trying to look more relaxed than I felt. There's just something that takes over. You can't stop it. Impulse control? What's that mean? Frederick said, struggling against his straitjacket, trying to get comfortable. It means that when you want to do something, you try your hardest not to. It means you try to control or suppress the urge to do things you know are bad. Frederick's mouth lolled open, He narrowed his eyes in confusion. Why would I want to do that? I suppressed the urge to sigh. Because that's what people do, I said. They think about doing bad things, but then they control themselves and don't do them because those things are wrong and could hurt other people. Hurting people is wrong, he said. 
Yes, Frederick, hurting people is wrong. He shook his head as if he were trying to shake away a fly that was annoying him. Why? Why is hurting people wrong? No, why are you telling me this? I don't understand. You're saying I'm bad, he said, trying to raise from his chair. You're saying I didn't need to hurt those people, that I'm a bad person. I got up from my chair and started backing toward the heavy metal door. I'm not bad, he yelled at me. You're bad. I knocked on the door and the orderly opened it as Frederick got to his feet. I slipped through the door as it slammed shut from the impact of his body hitting into it. Bad, 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 he screamed. Bad, 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 bad. Spit flew from his mouth landing on the small observation window with metal grates embedded in it. You okay, Doc? The orderly said, startling me. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. I turned and walked down the white hallway, hoping the orderly wouldn't notice the quickness in my step. I ignored the sound of Frederick beating on the door. I ignored all the sounds I heard. I just wanted to get away. It was a long walk to my office, through many security gates. At each one, the nurse buzzed me through and gave me an acknowledging look that used to be a smile. I suppose this place gets to everyone. Eventually. I finally reached my office, closed and locked the door behind me, and collapsed into my chair. I breathed out a sigh of relief at reaching relative safety. I turned and looked out my window to the beautiful flowers blooming on the trees in the courtyard. I looked up at the trees stretching toward the sky. I remember when they planted those. I turned back to my center, my means of solace, the only thing that mattered in this cruel, unfair world. I picked up the picture of my lovely wife and smiled. She was the one who kept me sane all these years. She kept me seeing the best in people, or at least trying. Sometimes there was no good to see, especially in my patients. It takes a special kind of doctor to care for the mental needs of those who have done heinous things that are so bad they don't even bother sending them to prison. They send them to me. I'm like the dumpster for the dregs of society. Just drop them in the asylum and forget about them. I kissed my wife and set her back on the bare desk, then turned on my computer and added notes from today's session. There was never a recommendation for release. Once patients came here, the only way they left was in a body bag. There was no curing them, only trying to make them docile until they left. Oh, and there were experiments. That was a large part of how we were funded. Companies would pay for certain tests to be done. Some might call it torture, but we called it research. I finished typing my notes and leaned back in my seat. The diplomas and degrees stared down from their perches on the bare walls, mocking me, demanding why I hadn't gotten a better job. As usual, I didn't have an answer. My office suddenly felt stuffy. I closed down my computer and left. Driving down the packed freeway, all I could think about was collapsing on the couch beside my lovely Elizabeth, not telling her about my day until she dragged it out of me, then listening to her encourage me to help those who have been left in my care, because I'm the only hope they have. Traffic was bumper to bumper and not helping my overall opinion of humanity much, especially when a car that was swerving from lane to lane nearly sideswiped me. It kept going on in front of me, nearly hitting several other cars. The driver and passenger seemed to be having a disagreement about how to drive the car, and it looked like it was about to come to blows. Fortunately, they were soon out of sight and someone else's problem. For the next few miles, I kept watching the side of the road, waiting to see the offending car sitting in a ditch. However... They surprised me. They must have turned off to go terrorize some neighborhood streets with their reckless driving. I hummed to myself, not wanting to have whatever dreck was on the radio forced on me. When I was nearly to my exit, my phone rang. I immediately recognized the number as work. I contemplated answering it for a moment, then thought better of it. 
There had never been a time when work called with good news, and I was in no mood for bad news. I hummed a little louder trying to drown out the sound of the ring before it finally stopped. The closer I got to home, the less I thought about work, and the more I thought about Elizabeth. Until I turned off at my exit, I had nearly forgotten work altogether. Maybe I would take tomorrow off and go do something with my wife. We hadn't been out for a while. The weather had been lovely, and I know she would adore a walk down by the lake. My thoughts were interrupted when I turned down our driveway and saw a car in front of the house. It wasn't quite in the driveway. It was sitting at an angle halfway in the front yard. I parked my car and slowly got out. Something struck me about this car, but I hadn't figured out what. I approached the driver's side to have words with the person still sitting at the wheel. Excuse me, I said, staying a few steps back from the driver's door. He didn't hear me. Excuse me, I said a little louder. Still no answer. I tapped on the window, and he ignored me. I opened the door. Okay, look, I said. But it was I who would do the looking. The man fell out of the car, thudding on the grass. The inside of the car was covered in blood. I looked down, and the man's throat had been cut. Oh my God, I said, jumping back. I watched to see if the man was breathing, but the way his neck was bent at an unnatural angle against my yard told me everything that I needed to know. I glanced through the car but didn't see the passenger. It was then my eyes drifted to my front door. It was open. I stepped through the shrubs and up onto the porch, walking in a daze. The surrealness of the moment had yet to sink in. I was going inside to check on my wife and make sure everything was okay. It didn't strike me as anything more than that. Oh, she just left the door open, that's all. My mind kept trying to tell me that. I wanted desperately to believe it, even though she had never been that careless during the entire time we'd been married. I had pushed aside all reason and common sense in favor of pure denial. Everything was going to be okay. With Elizabeth... Everything was always okay. She could literally light up a room with her positivity. She was the best person I ever knew. I have no idea how I got so lucky as to know her, let alone be her husband. I floated in through my front door on my cloud of denial and looked for my wife. It didn't take me long to find her. There was one wall of the living room she was constantly redecorating. She always said it looked bare and empty no matter what she did with it. She was hanging from that wall, naked, her beautiful body desecrated by slices and rips. Her throat had been slit, and blood still poured from it. I ran to her, tried to take her down, screamed her name, and then it was my turn to scream. I looked down and saw a knife blade sticking out from my abdomen. It was part of the cutlery set I had gotten for Elizabeth three Christmases ago. I screamed as I slowly turned to face my attacker. What's up, Doc? Frederick said, wearing a maniacal grin. The shock had punched a hole in my reasoning. I saw him standing there, but I couldn't accept it any more than I could accept my beautiful wife strung up like a macabre painting hanging on our living room wall. My eyes tried to focus on his face to make me recognize him as a threat. How's that impulse control working for you, Doc? He ripped the knife out of my back. The pain, along with his arrogance, woke me from my shock-induced stupor. Now do you understand? He said as he shoved the knife into my belly. I did understand. I understood at that moment that I was already as dead as my wife. I knew that this piece of human garbage had taken something beautiful from this world. I knew I had to do something about it before there was nothing I could do, before my body succumbed to injuries and I was unable. I grabbed him by the throat. He tried to laugh, but my grip was fueled by desperation. He tried to free himself, but couldn't. He began stabbing me over and over. I refused to release him. I carried him by his neck over to the kitchen counter and began bashing his head off the marble. 
I was rewarded with spots of his blood. I knew at least I had made him bleed, and that made me smile. His eyes grew wide as my grin grew maniacal. I smashed him repeatedly, crushing him against the sink, breaking the faucet and causing water to spray into the air. His eyelids fluttered as he lost his grip on the knife. He was nearly gone. I would take him with me, and that would be my parting gift to the world. Removing something so evil. Suddenly, my body wouldn't obey commands. My grip loosened. I tried to tighten it, but I had lost all control. I looked down and I was standing in a pool of my own blood. His eyes fluttered open and he coughed. No, 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 I thought. He can't live. He can't win. I had him. He stood as I sank to the floor. Looks like maybe you do understand, Doc, he said from what seemed like miles away. Too bad you won't be around to discuss it. We could have a session and evaluate how it makes you feel. His foot came down on my spine. I felt a crack. He started kicking me in the side repeatedly, splashing water and blood on me as I felt my ribs crack. I fought with everything I had. My body didn't even twitch. No! I screamed. It can't end like this! I heard a sizzling sound, and then there was darkness. Did you hear that? Better check the locks on your doors. Weekly Spooky will be right back. I could feel movement. Wasn't I dead? Was this what happened after? It was still dark. Hello? I tried to say. Nothing. Just the sensation of movement. Am I in a body bag? Am I on my way to the morgue or the grave? Please don't let me be buried alive. But I'm not alive. Am I? I don't feel any pain. That's a good thing, but not a good sign. The last thing I remember was lots of pain. Suddenly, there's a light and my movement stops. I look up from the floor of a house I don't recognize. Where the hell am I? I'm on the floor next to a wall, looking up at an electrical outlet. Nothing around me seems familiar. I try to stand, but it feels weird. It isn't difficult, and there's still no pain. It just carries an odd sensation with it, like my body is just relearning things. Just like when I was a toddler. I teeter back and forth as I rise, but eventually, I'm upright. My first few steps are tentative, but after that I gain confidence with each stride. Aside from the strange surroundings, there's a sensation, like ants crawling all over me. I pass a bathroom and glance inside. The reflection in the mirror draws me back. I slowly approach it, seeing something... Unique and terrifying. It looks like someone drew an outline of a human form using a lightning bolt. The electricity shimmers and crackles as it races around the empty form of the being. I wonder if it will hurt me. Not sure if I want to test the limits of my newfound lack of pain. I hesitantly reach for this creature. It reaches for me at the same time. I'm mesmerized by this mutual curiosity. My hand is about to touch the electric pulse shaped like its hand. I tremble with anticipation and fear as we touch. Surprisingly, I don't feel any pain. I don't feel anything except a hard surface. I move my hand back and forth. The creature does the same. I make quicker movements and so does it. Finally, out of frustration, I reach back and strike at the creature. My hand strikes the hard surface and it splinters. There are now multiple creatures staring back at me. I step back and make a horrible realization. I am the creature. One month later, 
and police have been unable to find any credible leads in the string of brutal killings that began shortly after the patient escaped from the mental hospital last month, the handsome anchorman stated from behind his desk. They're asking people to call in if they know the whereabouts of Frederick Winston, now known as the Mangler. In other news, the Larson Electric Company has issued a statement that the recent power surges are no cause for alarm. These surges seem to be random in people's homes and certain businesses. An LEC spokesman stated that there appears to be no pattern to the surges and that so far no one has reported them causing any harm. LEC is tracking down the problem and should have it under control soon. The anchorman shifted in his seat and turned to another camera. And on a lighter note, with Halloween months away, it seems that reports of ghosts are on the rise, he said, wearing a half grin. Several area residents have reported what they call a ghost-like figure outlined in light visiting them. Reports vary as to the duration and location of the visits, but they do seem to have a few things in common. The visits are usually short. In fact, most people say that if they blink, the figure is gone. No one has reported the ghost doing any harm, and it seems like anyone within close proximity feels a tingling sensation and their hair standing on end. Maybe I should be visited by this ghost instead of my next hairdresser's appointment, the attractive woman anchor said with a laugh. Schedule me a visit too, the male anchor said, smiling. And that's our news for the evening. Good night. Jimmy switched the channel. Give me a break, he said to the TV. Ghosts? Who's playing what? This is some marketing scheme to sell Halloween crap, like that stunt they pulled a few years back with the clowns hanging around the schools to promote that stupid movie. He switched off the TV and rolled over in his bed. It wasn't long before his breathing slowed. But before sleep could take him, he noticed a glow in the hallway. He didn't remember leaving any lights on when he came to bed. Living alone had its advantages. If he heard someone in his apartment, he knew they weren't supposed to be there. He slowly reached over to the bedstand and pulled out his Glock 9mm handgun, then held it close and listened. He watched as the glow moved. It seemed like someone was looking around. But for what? He didn't really have anything aside from his TV, phone, and video games. If anyone wanted those, they would be in a world of hurt. He had been lucky to get this apartment. If he was honest with himself, it cost more than he could afford. But when he had the chance, he took it. It was too bad the opening came because the person who lived there before him was one of the Mangler's victims. That's probably why he was able to rent the place so quickly and get the price down to where he could afford it, almost. Maybe the glow was one of the street people who were stupid enough to see if there was an empty apartment to claim. That wasn't going to fly either. Jimmy had jumped on this apartment to get away from the dingy rat hole he used to live in on the other side of town, and there was no way he'd let some bum come in here and take what was his. The glow crept closer. He could feel the hairs on his arms raise. There was a sound, too. It wasn't loud, almost felt more than heard. A soft crackle, like electricity when it sparked. The sensory input was almost too much for Jimmy to take. He pointed the gun in the direction of the glow and saw the barrel was shaking. His resolve that he could deal with anyone as long as he had his gun was beginning to fade. The glow became so bright that it finally took form. Jimmy's eyes widened. It was the form of a person, just like the news had said. It seemed to look around the room, then settle its gaze on the bed. Jimmy began to sweat as it approached and stared into his eyes. It was the oddest thing, staring into what should be eyes, but nothing was there. The flashes of mini lightning bolts formed shapes that looked almost human. But it was just an outline. There was nothing inside what should be the body. He shoved the shaking gun out from under the blanket and pointed it at the glowing figure. The figure noted the presence of the gun, then continued to advance. Stop, Jimmy said. I I'm warning you. The figure ignored the warning. Jimmy squeezed the trigger, setting off a deafening shot that went right through the face of the figure. It acted as though nothing had happened, continuing to advance. 
The ringing in Jimmy's ears made all sounds seem muffled. The figure stopped, two inches from Jimmy's face. Mangler, it said, sounding less like a voice and more like a transmission over an old staticky radio. I'm... I'm not the Mangler, he said. The person who used to live here was killed by him. It seemed to ponder this for a moment. Find Mangler, it said. I... I don't know where to find him. It moved an inch closer as the flashes of electricity arced and licked hungrily at Jimmy's face. Find him. Okay, okay, I'll find him, Jimmy said, feeling the heat from the electricity. The figure seemed to consider that for a moment, then backed away. It moved toward the bedroom wall. Then, like someone had turned on a vacuum, it was sucked into an electrical outlet and disappeared. Jimmy laid back in bed, breathing hard, His eyes darted left and right all around the room, but the only evidence of the figure that had remained was the bullet hole in his bedroom wall. The trips through the electrical conduits had become easier. There were still times when I came out someplace I didn't intend to, but I was usually able to recover quickly and get to where I wanted to go. But where did I want to go? At first, I wandered around, lost in this new form I found myself trapped inside. It was only after I had overheard a news report about the serial killer, they called The Mangler, that I gained my purpose. Of course Frederick was going to keep on killing. Of course they weren't going to be able to catch him. He'd been inside away from his victims before, and he didn't like it. Not being able to torture and kill innocents was like a normal person not being able to breathe. Not that I know much about being normal or breathing anymore. I suppose on some level I should thank him. I thought about it for a long time and the only thing that makes any kind of sense is, when we were fighting, somehow the water and blood I was laying in got splashed into an electrical socket. Instead of killing me, it bonded with me, making me able to become the electrical current to ride it like a wave to wherever I wanted. I became faster than any person ever was, and yet I wasn't a person anymore. I have no idea how I retained my consciousness, let alone my memory. But somehow, I justify it by the old adage, I think, therefore I am. My life has become an endless hunt for the person who destroyed me, the person I must destroy. I don't even know what I'll do when I find him, but I will find him. I will stop him. This time, I won't fail. I'll end him like I should have before. I owed it to the people he's tortured and killed since my failure. Most of all, I owe it to my wife. I know she wouldn't approve of my bloodlust. She would say there must be some other option but if she would be able to see her own dead body hanging naked from our living room wall, I think she just might change her mind. My thoughts are interrupted as I arrive at my next destination, another victim's house. I'm not sure what I'll find that the police haven't, but I have to try. Maybe I can pick up his scent somehow, a plan almost assuredly doomed to failure since I lost all sense of smell in the transformation. I'm surprised, though, that I can still see and hear. I suppose waves of light and sound somehow intersect with my electrical body, and it senses them. I don't question it. I've learned to just go with it. On the plus side, I don't have to worry about eating, drinking, or using the bathroom. I guess there's an upside to everything. Elizabeth would be so proud of me. I arrive at the room where the victim was murdered. Looking around, there's still blood everywhere along with evidence markers where they took pictures. The sheer amount of blood tells me he took his time. He desecrated this girl in her own room. Her parents must have been out because there's no way they didn't hear the struggle. There were books on the floor, a chair overturned, and blood everywhere. The room was a disaster. It looked like she fought him. I wish she would have succeeded where I had failed. But then... I wish I hadn't failed, and this girl was still alive. 
there's nothing I can do now except find him and end him. Finding him was proving more difficult than I thought. I had unlimited access to anywhere with electricity, but I couldn't use a computer or a GPS. I was limited to transportation only through electricity. Granted, that still made me the fastest being alive. I say being because I don't think I qualify as a human anymore. But I was limited to traveling to a place and then trying to find out where I was and if he was there. If he knew I was searching for him, all he would have to do is live the rest of his days in a cabin in the woods with no electricity, and I'd never be able to reach him. I believe two things worked in my favor with that theory. First, I don't think he's that smart. And second, I don't think he knows I'm looking for him. I believe that surviving our fight only further empowered him to kill. When someone feels invincible, they're bound to make a mistake. An officer walked into the room and I ducked back into an outlet. I was able to hang on where I was and watch from the inside of the outlet without being transported somewhere else. The officer looked startled and stared at the empty air that I had just vacated. She looked like she was unsure if she trusted what her eyes had seen in the instant before I vanished. She slowly stepped over to the corner and bent down to peer into the outlet. For a moment, I wondered if she could see me and what exactly she would see. But then her radio squawked, calling her to another scene. When I heard the voice on the radio say the address and that they might have the killer cornered, I didn't waste any time. It was maybe 15 seconds until I was across town at the address I'd heard. There was a lot of screaming and crying going on. I came out of the outlet and saw blood on the floor beside a body that wasn't moving. There was a girl being beaten by a man with his back to me. He turned to take another swing, and I knew my search was over. My therapist used to tell me I needed to work on my impulse control, he said calmly as he slapped her. I think I'm doing pretty good. I've been here ten whole minutes, and you're still alive. I shot across the room and knocked him to the floor. He jumped back and looked around for what had hit him. What the hell? I saw the fear in his eyes when he saw me. I know Elizabeth would have been ashamed of me. But I was enjoying his anxiety. After all he had done to me and so many others, I drank it in, like an elixir. He started edging toward the door. I was there in a heartbeat. His eyes darted back and forth where I used to be and where I now stood. The panic in his eyes doubled. I wanted to make him suffer, but I didn't want to make the same mistake I'd made before and let him escape with his life. I lashed out with a bolt that used to be my arm. The energy slashed through his shirt and fried a hole in his shoulder. He screamed in pain and horror as he looked at the smoking hole in his skin. He tried to run, but in an instant I was there in front of him, firing another bolt and searing the skin across his waist to his jeans. His screams of pain and rage were only matched by the feral desperation in his eyes. Not knowing what to do, he went with the familiar, attack the innocent. He grabbed the girl who had been crawling away from the scene. He grabbed her again and held her in front of him like a human shield. What a waste of skin. I fired a bolt into a ceiling light beside me which ricocheted and hit him full force in the leg, nearly severing it. He went down like a ton of bricks trying to hold on to his hostage, but she was fighting to get away from him. She broke free and he crumpled to the floor. What do you want? He screamed at me. With everything that is within me, I wanted to tell him who I was and what he had taken from me and what I was about to take from him but I didn't want to give him the satisfaction. I wanted to give him only uncertainty and fear to cling to. I could feel the seconds ticking away. I knew I had to make the most of this opportunity, or he would get away again. And after this, I might never find him. I unleashed every ounce of energy at him. I couldn't even see him. He was only a smoking pillar of frying skin. Just then, the police burst through the door. Freeze! The first officer started then. The shock of what he was seeing stole the rest of the word from his mouth. 
He stood there, mouth agape, when the female officer stepped in behind him. She looked at me, and her wide eyes narrowed as she put two and two together, and recognized me from the last crime scene. I had no reason to fear. I didn't know if I could even be harmed in my current state. But when you see that blue uniform burst through a door with a gun aimed at you, all rational thought takes a vacation. I dove for the outlet and was gone. I didn't even care where I was going. I knew I had done what I wanted to. The monster was destroyed. Something felt different. Was it pride at finishing my crusade? Was it shame knowing Elizabeth wouldn't have wanted me to do it? I don't know, but there was something else. It was like there was added weight to my existence. I guess you can have a conscience in whatever you'd call this existence. I appeared in the place that made the most sense, ironically. It was my old home, the one where everything I loved died, including me. It was where I took on this unintended new existence. Is that why I felt this extra weight? Was it some cathartic after-effect of my search for revenge that was finally over? I looked around the charred debris of what used to be my home. In my mind's eye, I didn't see the burned-out shell of what was left. I saw it as it was when we first moved in. When Elizabeth started decorating, when the interior was finally finished, and I turned to her and said, For now, knowing she would decide to change everything at some time in the future, when she was bored, just like all women seem to do. I remember getting a paintbrush across the mouth for that comment. I smiled, remembering kissing her with my freshly painted mouth and ending up in the bedroom. As I turned toward where I'd entered the house, my smile quickly faded. For some reason, I was still connected to the outlet. That had never happened before. Another curiosity arose when I noticed the color of my electrical body was now tinged purple. It had always been blue before. The tail of what had yet to come out of the outlet was red. As I pulled and it came the rest of the way out, it merged with me and turned purple. What the hell? I heard someone say. I whipped around, but no one was there. Where am I? The voice said. Who are you? I said to the air. There was a long silence. Doc? The voice said. As far as I knew, it wasn't possible for my spine to turn to ice, since I no longer had a spine. But the feeling seemed the same. Frederick? I said. What happened? He asked. This crazy electric thing attacked me, and now... Wait a minute. How am I talking to you? You died months ago. My shock gave way to utter despair. My enemy was now part of me. I've always heard the expression, those who seek revenge should dig two graves. But this is a very interesting twist on it. And I want to say an extra special thank you to author Michael Kelso for letting us read his story right here on the show. And if you want to find out more about him, just check out the link in the show notes. And I want to let you all know this Friday, we have a very special show dropping on the feed. It's from my other podcast, Do You Even Movie? It's our review of one of the most underrated werewolf films of all time, Bad Moon. So make sure to check that out this Friday. If you haven't checked out Do You Even Movie before, this is a nice taste of when we cover horror films and the like. Also worth mentioning, things are heating up over at Patreon. Our 12-part series, The Weekend is nearing its conclusion. You don't want to miss it, so head over to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get two installments of our current Strickfield series every month. And we have another one planned very soon, but this one is all about a group of kids who go camping in an abandoned campground and find that there's vengeance on the menu along with ticks and bug spray. And speaking of Patreon, I want to say an extra special thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters. These are folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show. And they are 
Johnny Nix, John Callen, Bobbletopia.com, Jenny Green, Brent McCullough, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. If you want to hear your name with their names at the end of every show, just go to weeklyspooky.com, click on Patreon, and choose a tier at $15 a month or higher. It really helps us out. It helps us bring the spooky every single week for over 250 weeks. I couldn't be prouder to say that, but now it's time for me to get out of here and get back to work because we have so much more coming in the weeks to follow. So for myself, for my producer, Dan Wilder, our executive producers, Mark Shields and Rob Fields, and our composer, Ray Mattis, I will talk at you next time. So stay electric. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you are safe. Trust me. Ha, 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 ha.